Okay, gang, so let's continue on our talk about community ecology, and let's talk about some predator-prey interactions. So most of us know what predation is. Predation is just where one animal feeds off of another animal, and those type of interactions have led to some pretty uh, interesting adaptations uh, through the process of evolution. And so one of the things I want to talk with you guys about is about some different defensive strategies that organisms will use to either help ward off predators or something that may help them to catch prey or to help win out in in just uh, cases of competition. So these different defensive strategies. So one of the first ones I'll talk to you about is about warning colorations. So some animals are really good at seeing some colors. Not all animals can see all colors. Um, But warning colorations usually advertise, um, uh, in this case, the poison arrow frog would actually advertise that it's toxic. Um, Some animals advertise that they can sting. Uh, Some advertise that they're venomous. Um, Not all uh, bright colored things are advertising that they're uh, they're, uh, poisonous or venomous. Some advertise that they're ready to mate or uh, like... uh, uh, apples on a tree are, are red, so that way we can see them, so we can, we can see them and eat them and, and disperse the seeds around. Um, but this poison arrow frog, I mean, most people know that poison arrow frogs, uh, uh, you don't want to touch them, you don't want to mess with them. So they're brightly colored to say, hey, don't mess with me. I'm, I'm toxic. You don't want to mess with me. I want to make sure you see me, so that way you don't mess with me. Um, and there are some colors that we see in nature that are very common for types of warning colorations. Um, some of these, and we actually use these colors in our everyday lives for the same reason. Uh, um, so what color is a stop sign? Well, it's red, right? Red is a warning color that we use a lot of it in, in, in society and in nature because it's an easy color for us to see. Mammals and birds pick up on reds very well. And so that's a very good color for us to see. Um, what color would caution be? So if you think about it for a second, you pull up to a, a, a stoplight. What color means caution? Well, it's yellow. Well, what color are uh, bees and wasp? Well, a lot of them are black and yellow. Uh, the contrast between the dark color black and the color yellow doesn't mean, hey, I'm not toxic but you better be careful because I do sting. And we see warning colors all over the place in nature, alerting us to different uh, um, uh, uh, scenarios that may come across where we may be cautious or just avoid altogether. So that's a pretty good strategy for warning off predators. Now, one frog may die when it gets eaten by a predator, um, but when that predator dies from having eaten it, like if someone were to eat the poison arrow frog, all the other members of that predator's species or group, at least the ones that are there to see it happen, will say, hey, he ate that frog. I ain't going to eat those frogs because he died, and I don't want to die. And so it's success. The, the individual may have died, but the species will still continue to live on, and that's really what's important. Another good way to, uh, to have a good, stra- a good strategy for uh, either avoiding predation or helping capture prey is, is mimicry. So here we have a case of mimicry. One of these is a milk snake, which is non-venomous, and one of them is a coral snake, which is venomous. So the old saying is, if red touches yellow, bite a fellow. If red touches black, friend of Jack. So in this case, we can see here the red touches the black, so this one's a friend of Jack. So this is a non-venomous snake, right? This is the milk snake. Here we have red touching yellow. Oh, this is a bite fellow. This is the coral snake. We have to have both of these in Mississippi. And um, it's good to know which one's which because you don't want to mistake them. Well, th- imagine that you're a predator and you eat snakes and you live in an area where both of these are located. Um, are you going to take the chance at eating this one even though you know that those colorations are, are usually a warning coloration? Say, hey, I'm venomous. Don't, don't come near me. You're probably not going to take the risk. So the milk snake has mimicked the, uh, the patterns on the coral snake to help it avoid predators, even though it's not actually coral. I mean, uh, milk snakes are not actually um, are venomous. They're actually pretty tasty, I'd imagine. Whereas coral snakes, don't want to mess with those. Those, those, will, 
those will get you. And they get us too. So don't humans are, you know, can die from these bites, snake bites from the coral snakes. So don't mess with them if you see them. They're very rare in our area, but we do have them. So mimicry, another one's the monarch butterfly and the viceroy butterfly. Monarch butterfly caterpillars eat milkweed, which has a toxic uh, chemical inside of it that doesn't hurt the um, doesn't hurt, hurt the monarch butterfly at all. But if something eats the monarch butterfly, it's really bitter tasting and it's, it's not good to eat. So the viceroy butterfly actually looks just very similar to at least uh, the monarch butterfly. So birds won't eat the monarchs. They also don't eat the viceroys. So another good way to uh, avoid a predation is don't be seen, right? So camouflage is where you blend in with your surroundings. And being here in the South, we know all about camouflage. Hunters wear this all the time. People wear this to class. You know, it's just how it is. So camouflage, just a great way to blend in with your habitat to avoid being seen. Now, this can help predators capture prey. This can also help prey avoid um, being caught by predators. So this is one good strategy to use. Another good one is a physical deterrent. So thorns. Anybody ever, ever eat a rose stem? Well, of course not. They're covered in thorns. You're not going to eat that. You're going to want to avoid it. Um, lots of times people will plant roses around their house. I know I do uh, for the reason that people aren't going to try and climb over your fence or climb up into the window if they have to stand in roses in order to do that because roses are covered in thorns. It's a physical deterrent, something physical that's there that keeps you um, away. Another good example would be uh, quills on a porcupine or horns and antlers on uh, horns on a cow or antlers on a deer. Those are all physical deterrents that are going to make you want to not mess with it. Physical large size um, makes you generally makes people not want to, to get too close to animals. Something that's cute and tiny, well, that's a different story. Um, but large things we tend to want to back away from because large size is a physical deterrent. Um, another way is chemical warfare. Now, you probably think, yeah, well, obviously skunks use chemical warfare. They, they, they have two musk glands. Uh, that they produce a foul-smelling musk that they can spray out, and it's sticky, it gets on you, and you smell terrible for a long time. Um, if you've ever driven down the road, you can smell it. You can, you, you'll smell. You'll know when somebody has run over a skunk. Uh, you, you can smell it pretty, and it's pretty strong. That's a chemical warfare. Plants are notorious for chemical warfare. We don't necessarily see it because a lot of it happens below the soil, where the roots are. So let's say there's two plants that are growing next to each other, and they're competing for the, the space, they're competing for the water and the nutrients in the ground and competing for sunlight. Um, uh, the roots grow usually grow out a lot further than the leaves do uh, of the plant. And when those roots come in contact with another individual or another me a member of a different species, um, the roots usually can have chemical receptors that, which can tell, hey, is this, is this me I'm touching? Is this another member of my species? Or is this a member of a different species? And depending on what it thinks it's touching, it will start to release chemicals into the soil that can, act, that will actually kill uh, their competition off. And so that's an example of chemical warfare. So you can't really talk about predator-prey interactions uh, uh, and, and um, community interactions without talking about parasites. Kind of disgusting, I know, creepy crawlies. But parasites are an important part of our ecosystem, so they, they, it, it's important that we go over them. So parasites, most people know this one. This is a type of a relationship where one species is harmed and the other one benefits generally without killing the host. That is a parasite. So example, a tick or a flea or a mite. Uh, if a tick bites you and sucks your blood, it's kind of hurting you. It, I mean, it's, it's definitely not helping you and it's not being benign. It's, it's kind of hurting you because um, it's taking something from you that you need to live. It's not going to kill you. Now, on yes, ticks can... Uh, uh, carry Lyme disease, which can make you sick. In some cases, death can occur from that. Uh, but in and of itself, the tick does not kill you. Because um, the first rule of being a good parasite is to not kill your host. You need your host to stay alive so you'll have a food source. Uh, so parasites generally don't kill their host. But there, you know, there's, there's other types of things that we'll talk about that do kill their host. So usually the host will have a defense against the parasite, and that can be anything from antibodies to, uh, that are produced uh, to help remove the foreign object or take care of it from an um, immune system point. Um, thick skin, so that way mosquitoes can't bite through you. Uh, cattle and horses in a field will swish their tails. They have long tails to help swish flies away. 
Um, and some social creatures actually go through grooming behavior, like monkeys will sit in, in, in groups, uh, some of the great apes will sit in groups as well, and they actually groom each other. It's a social bonding time, but they're actually removing fleas, ticks, mites, other types of parasites um, that, to, help, to help quell that, to help uh, uh, tone that down a little bit. But another type of parasite is called a brood parasite. And a brood parasite, it doesn't feed directly off of the, uh, the individuals that it's, it's parasitizing. Um, but it indirectly feeds off of them. So in this picture, which one of these eggs is not like the other? Well, you've got a bunch of different eggs in there, but obviously one of them sticks out. The one that sticks out is actually uh, a cuckoo's egg. Um, and a cuckoo is a brood parasite. So what happened is that uh, when the parents weren't looking, a female a cuckoo bird flew in and laid her egg in this nest. Once the cuckoo hatches, and it usually hatches before the other ones do, its instinct is to push all of the other eggs out of the nest as much as possible. And it was, before its eyes are even open, it will, have, it will start pushing and, and shoving and working hard to get all of those other eggs out of the nest. And the idea is that the parents uh, of, of the other eggs will come back and say, hey, one of my babies is hatched, I'm going to start feeding it. They treat the cuckoo as if it's one of their own. Uh, the cuckoo will actually outgrow the nest. Cuckoos are, are, are pretty big birds. Um, there's actually a little video that I've, I've linked on our modules that actually goes through an example of this, and it shows this massive cuckoo bird uh, um, uh, in the nest, or actually filling up and overflowing out of the nest, and the parents of the other bird species are actually just keep bringing it worms because they think it's its own. Um, is it feeding directly off of the uh, other species? No, but it is definitely parasitizing them because it, it killed all of their offspring. So it harmed one species while it itself was, was, was benefited. It didn't kill its host. It didn't kill the parents. Um, but it's definitely a, definitely a parasite. Uh, and the last type of parasite is called a brood parasite. Excuse me, it's called a, a parasitoid. Uh, parasitoids are just like parasites, but as where, whereas parasites don't generally kill their whole host, a parasitoid does kill its host. So here we have a caterpillar larva that's crawling around, minding its own business, and it gets stung by a um, uh, this gets stung by a fly, and the fly actually lays its eggs right under the skin of, the, of this caterpillar. And the caterpillar recovers from the stun, goes about its business, and keeps eating, but he doesn't put on any weight. All of the nutrition that he was getting from eating is all being used to feed the maggots that are growing inside of him. I know it's disgusting, but isn't it cool, though? So as he grows and grows and eats, he gets to a point where he realizes something is wrong, and he stops eating. And at that point, the larvae inside of him start to eat him. And once they grow to a certain size and they filled up their bellies, the, they will bust out. Of the, uh, of, of the caterpillar, and they'll crawl along and morph into flies and fly off, and they're good to go. It kills the host, um, and it's definitely a type of parasitism, um, but it's called a parasitoid because it actually kills the host. So parasites do not kill the host. Uh, parasitoids do kill their host. And then we have um, uh, brood parasites that actually feed off the parents, kill the offspring, and uh, just know that all hosts generally have some type of defense that they put up against uh, parasitites, uh, par parasites and parasitoids. So um, I hope that was some useful information, and uh, I'll see you in the next video.